We're going to do our best this afternoon to, to wrap up a series that we've been on for a while, um, talking about developing faith in a faithless world, okay? And so that's our goal um, here this afternoon. But I do want you guys to know and to be praying about this as well. We've been talking about kids camp now for a while, and we've got, uh, it's really exciting, we've got eight eight youngsters that are signed up to go to kids camp this year at Camp, at camp Kellogg, August 15th to the 19th. We got four boys and four girls. I, I don't know how that happened, but it happened, right? Equal numbers, and uh, we're, we're going to have a blast. And so just be praying. I've really just been praying already that God would really leave his, his handprint upon their lives, that they would have an encounter with him that would change them for the rest of their lives. And so I want to invite you to be praying as well. It's going to be an important time. It's going to be, it's going to be fun. We're going to be exhausted and pray for us leaders as we go. Because uh, you know how it is when you're not sleeping in your own bed and you get a bunch of kids together and sugar and they're like, I don't need sleep. Who wants sleep, you know? So it's going to be fun. Um, <clears throat> so I have to say, um, what was it? July the 3rd, July 3rd. So just about a month ago, the start of this month. We, we met over at the park, and there was like nine, was it nine churches that came together in the middle of Monmouth, Oregon, and openly read the scriptures, openly worshiped God, openly prayed. It was just a, a really amazing Sunday. I, I have to say, I've never been a part of something that felt so community, so much community connection, you know, and that's, that's what it's about, because I don't know about you, but there's not going to be different churches in heaven, right? There's just the one body of Christ, and we're going to all be together. Um, but later that afternoon, after we enjoyed some of the amazing food, and thank you, Michelle and Grace, for the, for the pointers on some of the uh, taco carts. I'm just saying it was very good. Thank you for the tips. Um, we ended up going and hanging out down in Albany. One of the, one of the families here, Chris and Ashley, lived down there, and they had invited some of us families down. And so we were, we were thinking about, okay, we're going to get stuff set up for the kids. You know, we're going to have a good time. And so we had all these games, you know, bocce ball and croquet, and we were getting basketball set up. And Chris has this area that they've laid a bunch of asphalt, and it's a loading zone for their farming. But he's like, hey, what if we put the basketball hoop out there? This will be a lot of fun, right? And so the kids are going to have a great time. Well, it took about five minutes, and, you know, us boys, we're really the kids, we're like, let's play basketball, right? This is going to be great. Let's just play some mean two-on-two -two basketball, right? We're in shape. We, we do this all the time. Nobody's going to get hurt. It's only 85, almost 90 degrees outside. It's going to be a lot of fun. And so we do. We start playing basketball, you know? And I don't know about you, but sometimes when you think about something that you think you have the ability to do, maybe like 20 years ago, you know, 20 years later, it kind of changes a little bit, especially if you haven't been practicing. Oh, wow. And so, uh, long story short, we, we were playing for a while, and pretty soon I, I started noticing that the world was getting smaller. And I noticed I was breathing very heavy, and the taste of blood was in my mouth, you know, and I'm thinking, man, this isn't good, you know? And so I had the ball in my hands, and you know what I was doing? I was doing this. Let me, let me show you here. I was like this. <gasps> you know, I'm just trying to catch my breath, you know? And so I'm assuming that position, and they were making fun of me because I was the old guy on the court, but... It was probably about five minutes of that, you know, just trying to catch my breath, right? And I don't know about you, but um, there's, there's certain things in life that, that take some endurance, right? And, and we're going to talk this afternoon about the fact that we need to have faith that has endurance. Faith that can actually stand tests and trials and challenges and difficulties and still continue to press on. And that's, that's the kind of faith that we really need established into our lives. Um, looking back, at, in another example I wanted to give here before we jump into this is uh, um, I did track in high school for a couple years. I know Matt, was a, Matt did track in college even. Um, but I remember, I'll never forget this because I did track my, my junior and my senior year of high school. And my junior year, I was you know, completely green, didn't know anything about track. And I'll never forget the day that it was the tryouts for the 400 meter. Now, if you're not familiar with the 400 meter, basically it is a, it's one full entire loop around the track. But it's not just any loop around the track. It's like a sprint around the entire track. And, and what happened is I was began to watch as these young men and young women began to do this, this tryout race. And they're trying to get their best time. And they would get to the end, and I started noticing that most of them were then going over by the fence. And I was like, what are they doing over there? 
And the coach was like, oh, they're, they're throwing up, right? They, they've ran too hard and they're not, they don't have the endurance to really make it, but they want a good time because they won on the team. And I was like, I don't want to do that race. <laughs> I'm out. So here's the thing. I, I, I wanted to share that story because I think there's this reality that we don't want a faith that's going to burn out after one time around the track. We, we want a faith that is going to take us all the way. Should God tarry until he comes back? Until he comes back or should he tarry until we grow old and we pass on? We want to have that kind of faith that we can pass on to our kids and our grandkids and the people that we are privileged to do life with, right? So let's open up our Bibles here for a few moments uh, to Hebrews chapter 12. And uh, before we read that, I just want to share this big idea with you that we need to develop a faith that can endure the struggles and the difficulties of life. We need to develop a faith that can endure the struggles and the difficulties of life. So let's go to Hebrews chapter 12 here. And I will say, I want to encourage you all to be here next Sunday because Asherah, who was uh, taking the tithes and offerings and dismissing our children, is going to be up here preaching next Sunday. It's going to be awesome. And uh, so I encourage you to be here and support her. It's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, Hebrews chapter 12 in verses 1 and 2 says this, Therefore, since we... Now, before I finish reading this, remember, we've been talking out of Hebrews chapter 11. And it's, it's really this big chapter on faith, right? We, we understand that without faith, it is impossible to please God. And so he's been going through and he's been talking about all these faith giants of old. And now we're in Hebrews chapter 12. And he says, therefore, since we also have such a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that lies before us keeping our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. For the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So it's it's pretty cool because the first thing that the, the scholars believe that they're describing here when he says we're surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses This is like a a group of martyrs that have gone on before us. And here's the great news. You and I are not journeying through this race alone. First of all, we need to understand that Jesus is doing life with us every single day of the week. And not only that, but those who have passed and gone on before us, they are rooting us on. I want you to picture a stadium full of people that have given their lives for the gospel because they love Jesus and they want to do life with him. And guess what? They want you to succeed and they are rooting us on. They are chanting your name. I don't know if you remember these commercials, but there was a commercial for a while and uh, the guy would get like a Starbucks beverage, you know, and he'd be walking around and be like, Steve, 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 right? Steve, Steve, come on. Help me out a little bit here, right? And they're just rooting them on, right? It's, anyway, forget it, okay? But my point is, is they are calling on your name and they're trying to encourage you. Because, why? Because life is full of difficulties and it's full of struggles. All right, so the first thing that it tells us that we need to do is that we need to throw off distractions. We need to throw off the distractions that are in our lives because if we, if we allow them to, what, what do distractions do? They get you off course, right? They, they, they get you off focus. And that can definitely be a problem for your life and mine. Now, I mentioned, I mentioned uh, the track season. And I thought I would just go ahead and run with that theme here this afternoon. But I, I don't know about you guys, if you ever did track or, or sports, but our coach insisted that we wear the jerseys that the school district said that we had to wear. And what that meant is a very small tank top and extremely short shorts. Now, I don't know about you, but I am an Oregon boy, and these thighs don't see much sunshine, okay? So when you put them in really short shorts and a small tank top, I'm telling you, people go blind, all right? It's uncomfortable for them and for me, okay? Okay. But anyway, and I don't know about you, but track season tends to be in the time of year when it's raining and it's cold, but then sometimes you get a little bit of sunshine. That's just track season in Oregon. And so what we would do is we'd wear hoodies and sweatpants or warm-ups or whatever, and we'd be all bundled up, you know, because I don't know about you, but when you're real cold and shivering, can you run very fast? It's hard, isn't it? 
And so what we would do, we'd wear those things, and then you're standing there getting ready to get the race going on, and you're like peeling things off, you know? And, and I want you to take that picture for a moment because this is the same example of throwing off our distractions. You see, um, when, when we get ready to start that race, you could run with your hoodie and with your sweatpants, but you would literally lose seconds on your time in that race. So the best thing you could do is you'd throw them off, quickly jump into the blocks, boom, the gun would go off and you'd take off and you'd run. And I, and I think it's important for us to see as believers, and we're talking about developing a faith that can endure the struggles and difficulties of life, we need to understand that we gotta be willing to throw off distractions. So I thought it would be helpful if I gave a couple examples there's all kinds of examples. Just about anything could be a distraction. And I find it interesting that he, the, the writer of Hebrews, specifically says throw off distractions, or throw off, excuse me, hindrances in the translation I've been reading. And then he deals with sin, and we'll talk about that in, for a moment. So, so distractions or hindrances aren't necessarily sinful at all. They're just things that get us off course, okay? So a couple examples I was, I was thinking about, I don't know about you, but how many people spend their day like this? Do you ever go to a restaurant? I see this. You go to a restaurant and you find two people sitting at a table like this, not saying a word. I mean, I don't know about you and I'm not here to judge, but I kind of wonder, is there any intimacy in that relationship? right? It's, it, they can be a distraction. Now, is this a wonderful device? I carry this with me throughout my day. It helps me run my business. It helps me stay connected with people, with my wife, with my family. I can do all kinds of things on this. This is a great device, but it can also, if I'm not careful, be a distraction. How about television? You guys don't like watching TV, do you? TV ain't all bad, but you know, sometimes it's kind of nice to turn on a, a show or a movie and hang out, right? That's not all bad, but it can be a distraction. How about gaming? whether that's in person or online or over a device or just a good old fashioned get out a game and play, right? They can be a distraction or even sports, you know? Sports are amazing and they're a lot of fun, but sports can be a distraction. Or what about even relationships? And anyway, the, the examples could, could go on and on, but what I want you to see is in themselves, they're not wrong or bad or sinful, but there are things that if we're not careful, can get us off track. You know, when the runner is running the race, they, they need to stay focused. Um, let's look at Philippians 3, 12 through 14 here real quick. Philippians 3, 12 through 14 here. And my goodness, is it hot. All right. Paul says, Philippians 3, 12, not that I have already reached the goal or am already perfect, but I make every effort to take hold of it because I also have taken, excuse me, because I also have taken hold. I'm having a tough time. I make every effort to take hold of it because I also have been taken hold of by Christ Jesus. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and reaching forward to what is ahead. I think it's important that when we start our day, we recognize that our focus is supposed to be Jesus. That doesn't mean we don't prioritize our marriage. That doesn't mean we don't prioritize our kids. That, mean, that doesn't mean that we don't prioritize our jobs. Those things are important in life, okay? But what it does mean is that as I walk with my wife, I'm looking to Jesus. As I walk with my kids, I'm looking to Jesus. As I go to work and whatever kind of work that you do, I am choosing to continue to keep my eyes on Jesus. And, and the point I'm trying to make here is that that's the goal, right? Because as, as the Hebrew writer said, he's what? He's the author and the perfecter of our faith. And we're gonna talk more about that in a minute, but we need to realize we've got to keep our eyes on Jesus. That's the only way that we're ever gonna be able to develop a faith that can, that can plow through the struggles and the difficulties of life. You know that God can give you a faith that can go through a rocky marriage. God can give you a faith that can go through a difficult family situation. God can give you a faith that'll help you through the hardest financial times you've ever faced in your life. God can give you a faith to stand firm in him and you'll make it to the end of the race, which is the end of life. So distractions get our eyes off of the prize 
where I want to I want to put an image in your head. Sin is a snare or a trap, right? The Bible says the wages of sin leads to death. But I want you to think, how many of you guys like spiders? Anybody like spiders? Spiders are gross. Tim and I were tearing down a fence the other day, and I saw spiders I didn't even know existed. And I was, uh, I was pretty sure that I was going to squeal very high pitchily if one got on me. But we worked real hard, and we worked real, real tough to be manly so we didn't scream, you know? But spiders do something really unique. They form a web. And that web is sticky, and I think it comes somewhere out of the body of the spider, which is kind of gross. But anyway, but the purpose of that web is what? To trap bugs. And if a bug gets into that web, what happens? If they don't break free of that web, the spider's gonna do what? He's gonna come, he's gonna eat that bug, that bug is gonna die. And I think it's important that we can understand and see that's how sin is in our lives. That's why he says, the Hebrew writer says, throw off the distraction and the sin that so easily entangles us. So I need, I need somebody to help us out here real quick this afternoon. Is there anybody willing to help me out up here? Anybody? Shane, I, this one, you, I appreciate that, Shane. Hold, hold on to that, man. This one, might be a little, this one might be a little rough. Okay, somebody else, somebody else here. All right, Carmen, perfect. Carmen, get up here. All right. So Carmen, this is what I want you, this is Carmen, everybody. Okay. All right. Carmen, I want you to run straight back there and back here real quick. Just go, just go, go. She's a runner. Look at, she's a built runner, right? All right, come on back, Carmen. You are awesome for doing this. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Give it up for Carmen. All right. Now, Carmen, put that around your ankles. Okay. Now I want you to run there and back. <laughs> now, Carmen's exceptional, right? But the point we're trying to see here, let me ask you, Carmen, was that difficult? Yes, it was difficult. Was it easier the first time? I'm actually more out of breath this time, too. <laughs> okay. So thank you so much. Give it up one more time for Carmen. Come on. But I, but I want us to see this afternoon, that's, that's what distractions and, and sin can become. They can be worse. Like sin doesn't just, just get our eyes off Jesus. Sin is like, it ensnares us, it entraps us. And if we don't break free, I want you to know something. Just like that bug in the spider's web, we're going to die. And see, what we need is we need the power of Jesus in our lives. We've got to get our eyes back on him. Why? Because he breaks the power of sin and death. And by his blood, he cleanses us and he sets us free and we can keep moving on. Because guess what? Life is difficult and hard. And sometimes, even as we strive to keep our eyes on Jesus, we will get distracted. Sometimes sin will ensnare us. But praise be to God that we can go back to him and we can ask for his help and for his forgiveness. So the, the second thing we got to talk about this afternoon before I turn into a, a puddle up here is uh, we need to fix our eyes on the prize. We need to fix. You know, my kids really liked Frozen and the Olaf the snowman. You know, he's like, he talks about, you know, being in summer, right? He's going to do what snowmen do in what, summer? I like that line. That's fun. All right. So we got to fix our eyes on the prize. I, you know, I would not advocate for horse racing, but it is a pretty good example. Do you guys know that in horse races, that what they do because they don't want the horses to be distracted is they actually put blinders on the sides of their face. And the reason that they do this is they want the horse to have a focus and to look down the track. So that when that jockey is trying to get that horse to function and to operate at max capacity, you know, hence horsepower, right? Come on. The, the, the likelihood of that horse looking to the right or to the left is, is, is not going to happen. Why? Because there's blinders. And see, I want you to see this for a moment. This is what it's like for you and I to fix our eyes on the prize. We got to start putting up some blinders so that we don't get distracted on this journey of life. We don't, we don't get pulled aside every single time and get our eyes off of Jesus. We don't get pulled or ensnared or entrapped every time because sin got back into our lives. We've got to learn and to train ourselves. It takes discipline. You know, um, you, can't, you can't be an effective marathon runner if you don't discipline your body. You have to take, it takes effort to the, what you eat, what you actually put into your body, the exercises that you do to prepare yourself for such a long period of time of strain and stress to make it through. And that's a little bit like life. We've got to keep our eyes fixed upon Jesus. 
Because Jesus alone is the prize that we're looking for. At the end, guys, what we're looking for is we are looking for that well done, that good and faithful servant. You know what else I love about keeping my eyes fixed on Jesus? Do you know that Jesus said, come to me, all ye who are what? Burdened and heavy laden, and I'll what? I'll give you rest. We can go to Jesus and we can drink from that well of life and we can be restored and refreshed and renewed and we can continue down that path of life. When we keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, we can look over here and say, yeah, those things aren't bad, but I'm not going to allow them to become a distraction from, from looking at him. When sin comes walking along, because guess what? The enemy is relentless and he... He's really good at just throwing back at you what he knows you'll fail, what you failed out last time. And he'll try new ways to get you to fail at it again. But guess what? When your eyes are fixed on Jesus, it will give you strength and empowerment. It'll help you to stand firm in your faith because your faith will endure those tests. Your faith will endure those challenges and those difficulties in your life. And you will be successful because Jesus is successful. 1 Corinthians 9 you guys, uh, you guys aren't dying out there, right? You're doing okay? I prayed before service, and I said, Lord, nobody can have heat stroke today, okay? We can't have that. It's going to be hot, right? I asked him. 1 Corinthians 9, 24. Don't you know, don't you know that the runners in a stadium all race, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way to win the prize. Run in such a way to win the prize. We don't give up. We keep running. We keep pushing on. So I told you this afternoon, we need to develop a faith that can endure the struggles and the difficulties of life. For the sake of the heat and time here, I'm going to be brief. But I do want to just point out a couple things that are really important. If you go on to read in Hebrews chapter 12, he talks a little bit about discipline. He's specifically speaking about discipline pertaining to the discipline that we would exercise on our kids, right? To help what? To help change behaviors, to correct behaviors, to give guidance and direction, discipline, right? You and I need discipline in our lives. It's, it's key, it's essential, but I also want you to think about the fact that we also need spiritual disciplines in our lives. And I believe that spiritual disciplines are, are a pathway to opening ourselves up to the discipline of the Father. And the, and the fact the passage of Hebrews 12 says that if you're not disciplined by God, then you're illegitimate children. In other words, it's saying welcome the discipline of God. We need God's discipline in our lives. Why? Because you and I are formed of the flesh and the flesh is fallen. We give in so easily to sin and we need the love and the correction and the empowerment of God in our lives. So just a couple things I want you to think about as I close here. A couple ideas on, on some spiritual disciplines. We're living in a time and a place where the word of God, the Bible, has become something that few know much about. Biblical literacy is really at an all-time low. And it's, it's not something that we can take for granted you know, there was a time when the Bible was, was only written in languages that people didn't know and they couldn't read it or understand it. Guys, we're living in a time and a place where the Bible is almost written in every known language. It is God's message to his people. And I want to tell you something. We need to learn the discipline of opening this thing up and reading it and studying it. Become a student of the word of God. And guess what? When you do that, it gives you guidance and correction. It gives you help and strength. It'll help you every day to keep your eyes fixed upon Jesus because the things in your life that are distracting you or the sin that's trying to ensnare you, I'm telling you right now, Jesus said, my word is sharper than any double-edged sword. And guess what? It comes in and just cuts right through those situations. But we need this in our lives. And we have to learn to practice what it says. 
We've had a lot of discussions lately about loving our neighbors as ourselves. And I believe that Jesus wants us to practice that. He wants us to literally to love people. We're to walk with people. Love your neighbor as yourself. And the other things that are written in here, these aren't suggestions. This is God's plan for your life and for mine. Another spiritual discipline that's really important. I think we think of prayer usually is, well, I've ranted to God for 10 minutes and I'm gonna go on my day. That's prayer, right? Well, I wanna suggest something to you. We need to practice the spiritual discipline of listening. I had a manager years ago that said, God gave you one mouth and two ears, so I think you ought to listen twice as much as you speak. I'm still working on that. Anybody that knows me is like, yeah, Stephen, you gotta work on that. Okay, I'm a work in progress too. But we have to learn to listen to what God wants to say to us. We have to also learn the art of waiting. Do you know in Isaiah 40, I think it's 40, 31, it says what? Those who what? Wait upon the Lord would renew their strength. I don't know about you, but if I'm running this race called life and I'm dealing with difficulties and struggles and I'm, I'm trying to make it through, I need, I need Jesus's power to strengthen and to encourage me along the way. And so this is just a couple ideas. Another, another spiritual discipline that often gets overlooked is fasting. Taking time to say no to the most basic needs of life and to say, God, I want to give attention to you because I need you in my heart and in my life. So bottom line, if we, wanted to, if we want to develop an enduring faith that can lead us through this thing called life with all of its struggles, with all of its difficulties, even the moments where we want to give up, I, I've been there, I understand we have to fix our eyes on Jesus. Will you pray with me this afternoon? Father, I thank you for this opportunity that we have to be here together in your presence. And Lord, I know that it's hot, but Lord, you are so good. In fact, your word says, taste and see that the Lord is good. And I just pray, Lord, as we spend some time lifting up our voices, as we spend some time praising your name, God, I just pray that, that, God, you would move mightily in our midst. God, I pray that you would be that fresh water for those who, are, who have lost sight of you. God, that you would just come and be a, be a refreshing drink today in their spirit, in their heart and life, and that you would encourage them and strengthen them and help them to develop that enduring faith that would help them through this journey of life. And so, God, thank you for your precious word. Thank you, God, that you're speaking. We just love you and we honor you today. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.